exactly. Wonderful. Thank you for the introduction, Nicole. So let us start now with our topic of the day. So, you know, the, the goal of that meetup, um, that open discussion group, as we call it, uh, is to talk about ethics and philosophy of futures. Um, let me just present you with the team. Uh, you might know some of us, you might know most of us, maybe. Uh, so Chris is unable to be with, there today, with us today. I'm sorry about that, but uh, he really helped us prepare. So a big thank you to Chris. We also have the support of Viviana, Nicole, and Sherman at the Association of Professional Futurists. Um, so thank you so much for enabling uh, this to happen. Um, just a few notes about what we discussed in the two previous meetings for the ones who were not there or for the ones who don't remember that well, maybe. Uh, what we discussed in the first session was really uh, defining the scope and the objectives of this group. So we decided that we would focus on different topics each time. It could be contemporary topics or the philosophy of a particular topic. Uh, it, it will also aim at examining the broader background of some uh, topics related to foresight or specific elements related to foresight and philosophy. And finally, and I think that's usually what comes up um, along the discussion, we aim to uh, explore the futurist moral obligation to advance ethical futures. So the format, as you have seen last time, and as you will see this time, is mostly based on lecture. So you have a speaker where, who was last time was Ram has done a wonderful work of presenting uh, a lot of insights that we discussed then along uh, the discussion. And today we will have Timothy that I will introduce just after. Uh, we can also sometimes have some panel discussions if we have many um, participants who would like to come more in the format of a discussion. And we can also have reading groups. So last time we had um, reading uh, material before, this time we didn't, but uh, we can always uh, discuss also some more materials at the end uh, for the ones who want to, to expand um, their knowledge of the topics. And finally, in terms of output, uh, we discuss the possibility to write for APF's Compass, which is a publication of Association of Professional Futurists, or co-authoring articles on the Medium channel, contributing to something broader, maybe an ethical charter of code of conduct or guidelines that could um, be a basis for futurist and foresight thinking. And finally, providing feedback on the APF's competency model. Last time, we were very lucky to have uh, Ram Gayoso, who is there today, uh, talk um, uh, about taking humans out of what's of the future. And I wanted also to underline that uh, Ram just published the second um, issue of its International Market and Competitive Intelligence magazine. And uh, he wrote a wonderful article, which really uh, sums very, very well what we discussed last time. It's called Unsupervised Drones and the Future of Warfare. So I strongly invite you or recommend you to, to read it. It's wonderful, Ram. Uh, let me just go through a few topics that we discussed last time. Uh, and also, if you want to go uh, further in the discussion, uh, you know that Rome is our expert here, but we could also uh, plan another conversation or, or to follow on these topics because we really don't want the group to be just a one-time thing on each topic. If we feel that there's more material for more discussion, of course, we invite you uh, to help us schedule another discussion if you think uh, you can bring uh, more conversation around it. So we discussed last time autonomous warfare and drone warfare technology, especially. Um, thanks to Rome, we evaluate the use of technology and discuss charter, legitimacy, accountability, morality, and essence. And I think this distinction was what really made the conversation very productive. Uh, so we like to investigate concepts. Uh, that's also the basics of uh, philosophy. And I think that's also what will help us as futurists uh, to be precise and, and um, an optimist in the way we conduct our world. Our world, sorry. Uh, we also discuss the notion of true autonomy beyond just artificial intelligence. Uh, we made a distinction between ethics, legitimacy, accountability, and mor morality. We discuss that in length. Um, we also discuss the moral obligation of the enabler and uh, what happens if the program is operated outside its design parameters. Uh, we also discuss how strong regulation and warnings can be and what can we do when bad actors simply ignore them. Um, we also discuss realistic games. Uh, do they lower our ethics? Uh, do they make violence more casual? 
then we discussed perspectives or we started discussing it and we might want to discuss it further. Is there a notion of universal ethics? Whose ethics are we talking about? Uh, can we determine ethical futures when we cannot agree on what is ethical? We discuss our role as futurists working with clients and sometimes policymakers. Uh, are we a guide? Are we a higher hand? Uh, what is the weight of our opinion? Do we also uh, at APF as an organization propose a universal ethical framework? Um, another topic um, that we discuss more towards the end, what is the role of fiction in our discussion group? Um, can science fiction um, act as a moral allegory. Also, uh, we discussed toward the end our tendency to use a Greco Roman or Judeo Christian framing uh, and ask ourselves what non European language conversations reveal about war and conflict. We talked about First Nations, indigenous traditions, African traditions, Middle East, Eastern value. We, we started asking questions around this. We didn't really discuss it and we would really like uh, to go deeper in that topic in the following uh, meetups. And how has colonization and imperialism possibly changed control codes about killing people? So that, that might be the topic of one of our future sessions. Um, also adding a few fiction resources that some of you mentioned uh, during the meetups or after here. And I will now introduce you to our topic of the day. Let me just take a look at the chat, make sure we don't have any questions. So does anybody have um, any questions so far before I introduce today's topic? No? All right. So today we're going to talk about biotech, business and ethics. And I am um, very honored uh, to introduce Timothy Dolan. What there last time and really made a lot of wonderful remarks and uh, suggested we discuss this topic Today, so we prepared this past month, and um, we're so lucky to have you here today, Timothy. So le let me just guide uh, our participants today towards your your biography, your mini biography, because I'm sure it's much longer than I would be able to tell in one hour. So Timothy on his doctorate at the University of Hawaii and does the direction of noted futurist Jim Dater. So we are all super envious of you, I'm sure. Um, Timothy has subsequently pursued an active career as a professor and director of four graduate level management programs in the US and abroad, including Korea, Japan, Mexico, Egypt, Azerbaijan, and the Kurdish region of Northern Iraq. Timothy has published numerous articles, public policy reports, and book chapters in the foresight field. The most recent is a chapter for the book Leadership for the Future, edited by Thomas Menger. And Dr. Dolan is currently completing a chapter on the biotech industrial complex and ethics. So the perfect speaker for today. Just one last thing before um, I let you start, Timothy. I would just like to take um, maybe two, three minutes to uh, lay the ground uh, in terms of, of some uh, vocabulary thing. So we will be talking about biotech, business and ethics. Uh, we didn't officially mention biotech in the title, but I wanted to, to just remind us of a few dates, um, concepts and people that really um, laid the ground in that field. So we've been talking about bioethics uh, for the past almost 100 years. Um, we define it as a study of the ethical issues emerging from advances in biology and medicine. Uh, the first time we heard about it was in 1926, uh, and that was Fritz Jahr, uh, who defined a bioethical imperative regarding the use of animals and plants in scientific research. Then it took a while until uh, 1970 when it really became a hot topic uh, to hear um, the concept again, and there we talked about bioethics uh, through uh, Van Rensselaer Potter as a relationship between the biosphere and the growing human population, which was a big topic in the, in the 1970s. So Potter's work laid the foundation for global ethics. And what's really important here is that we don't see bioethics just as limited to biology, but really to a larger uh, multidisciplinary topic, um, because it makes the link between biology, ecology, medicine, and also human values. 
around the same time, uh, claiming also the, the invention of the word, we have Eunice Kennedy Shriver. Uh, we use the word bioethics as the application of the field of philosophy, namely moral philosophy, to concrete medical dilemmas. And since then, the field of bioethics has been evolving, ranging uh, from topics around boundaries of life, abortion, euthanasia, surrogacy, the allocation of scarce health care resources like organ donation, health care rationing, to the right to refuse medical care for religious or cultural reasons. Another thing I wanted to mention, and maybe uh, Timothy will mention it too, it's a very important report. It's a Belmont report, uh, 1979, which announced the fundamental principles of bioethics, and namely uh, respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Since then, also I've added uh, non-maleficence, human dignity, and the sanctity of life. So that's very important, this report, because it has guided research uh, for um, many, many years after that, with a focus on protecting vulnerable subjects and pushing for transparency between the researcher and the subjects. But what happened uh, is that the Belmont report at some point, um, many, many scientists need, think we need uh, to revise it because research has flourished this past 40 years, many things have happened and human subjects have outgrown uh, the needs that were claimed in the report. Especially the scope of bioethics uh, expands today with biotechnology, cloning, gene therapy, life extension, and genetic engineering. Uh, astroethics, if you're familiar with the concept, life in space. But also manipulation of basic biology, altered DNA, XNA, and proteins. So these developments will affect future evolution. And that's where we're already uh, touching a sensitive uh, topic that's very contemporary, because it may require new principles that address life at its core, such as biotic ethics, that value life at its basic biological processes and structures, and six, six propagation of life. Um, there's also one, one uh, sensitive thing here, and, and I'm sure Timothy will investigate it further, but gene therapy involves ethics because scientists are now making uh, changes to genes, like the building blocks of the human body, but not just in terms of treatment, also to, to ask questions about how changing our human um, nature. So currently therapeutic uh, gene therapy is available to treat specific genetic disorders by editing cells in specific body parts. But more and more, we are asking questions, and it hasn't been validated yet by uh, regulation. Uh, but around germline gene therapy, uh, it's super controversial because, in that case, genes uh, in a sperm or egg can be edited uh, to build uh, people on demand almost to prevent genetic disorders in the future generation. And here I'm really connecting with our topic um, of futures. And finally, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Yuval Noah Harari. Um, so his opinion on this is he's really seeing an existential threat in this arms race in AI and bioengineering. And quoting him, AI and biotechnology could destroy what it means to be human. So he expresses the need for close cooperation between nations to solve the threats by technological disruption. And another concept, just mentioning it, is a uh, and biotic with six to secure and expand life in galaxy. So just wanted to, to kind of lay the ground before we start the conversation in terms of where we are at in terms of concepts and terminology. And now I'm very excited to let you um, the floor. Um, let me stop the sharing. I'm not sure I can, okay, stopping the sharing. So that's Timothy, you can. Uh, start your presentation. So you will speak, I think, for about um, 30 to 40 minutes, and then we will have an open conversation so that everyone can ask questions and share their thoughts. And um, at the end, for the ones who are maybe able to go beyond the hour, uh, we will do a wrap up uh, so that we can have kind of a, a list of our open topics or our insights of the day, um, same as we did last time. So Timothy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvia, and uh, colleagues for joining uh, during this session. Um, it's a big topic. 
um, quite a bit to say on it. I'll be covering it in very, very broad terms, um, a mile wide and an inch deep, or for my European and Canadian colleagues, a kilometer wide and a centimeter deep. Um, but I think each one and every one of these slides individually could be a lecture unto itself. So I am going to be talking rather fast given the time constraints, um, just bear with me. Um, so we have been altering evolution for quite some time. You consider um, the development of corn. Corn is a completely artificial grain. It is so domesticated that it cannot grow wild. It has to have intervention by humans to even be planted and cultivated. Uh, I should also add that maize itself uh, was um, probably developed from millet. Uh, and again, there's an ancient connection with that, which I'll address a little bit later. Um, another, of course, we have the domestication of dogs, horses, and livestock. Uh, to the extent that, uh, for example, cattle uh, in its present form could never survive uh, as uh, on their own, even as a herd. Uh, the domestication of dogs, of course, was, was uh, prehistoric in nature. Uh, by the way, what is the difference between a cat and a dog? That's a rhetorical question. I don't want to start a discussion on that right now, but uh, the joke is that a, a dog will come when called, a cat will take a message and get back to you. Um, the, uh, the total dependence of dogs on humans is actually legally fixed. Dogs are considered property, cats are not. In the American uh, legal system, cats are defined as a domesticated predator. And uh, the distinction being that they can exist uh, independent of human intervention or care. Dogs, generally speaking, don't. I mean, they do run as packs. I've seen that personally in Egypt and Azerbaijan. But by and large, your toy poodle is not going to make it in the real world. Uh, so I think we can all um, acknowledge human intervention on evolution has been going on for quite some time. Other examples include, of course, with the rise of uh, agriculture, uh, we have unwittingly join sides um, in a vegetative battle between the grasses and the trees um, by cultivating, opening up forests for cultivation, we have taken the side of the grasses and cultivated any number of grains, oats, wheat, barley, corn, the aforementioned corn, et cetera, uh, at the expense of trees by and large. And that deforestation and cultivation of those lands is, um, continuing, of course. So it's another perspective that we might take with us about where we stand in terms of that ecological um, battle, if you will. Um, hybridization, of course, has been going on for quite some time. We have any number of very exotic varieties of now uh, plants and animals. Um, just look at the range of breeds of dogs, uh, for example, um, among other things. Um, we've had human-driven extinctions. So our, our impact on, on evolution and, and, and natural processes has been going on for quite some time. Um, of course, now we're into the age of cloning so, so that you don't even need to have the um, typical impregnation and gestation process take place. I'm going to take a little time out because, again, the topic is um, biotech business and ethics. And it's important because as a kind of primer here, my background is in public policy. This is familiar ground for me, but I can't assume that with everybody. And it's a very important, I think, to get this little primer on industrial complexes. We've heard this term, most familiar with the military industrial complex within the United States, but there is a biotech industrial complex as well. And it is, uh, it turns out, a hybrid itself uh, and is quite complex. It includes the medical industrial complex and the food industrial complex. So those two massive 
uh, institutional forces are combined in biotech, making it ever more potent. So uh, as I said, these, these complexes are complex. So the first dimension to understand the relationship between government, industry, and the public is um, on the dimension of information. So as you can see, the heavy lines, the heavy arrows on the right side are between government and industry. They have very solid lines of communication. You can bet that the CEO of major agribusiness and biotech corporations have a direct line to say the Secretary of Agriculture or the Minister of Agriculture, if you will, uh, and um, you know, Health and Human Services, et cetera. Uh, these people are in touch with each other constantly. Um, and then on the legislative side, of course, you have the lobbyists and, and, uh, and such. So there's a constant back and forth, as opposed to, again, that bottom line where industry dominates through advertising, conditioning the public to have a certain impression uh, of their operations with the public feeding back, but often that feedback is initiated by the industry in order to fine tune their message back to the public. So that feedback loop, again, advantages industry. Um, and then you have, of course, the government public connection. The public is intermittent in its uh, messaging to government, either angry letters to a, you know, a, a legislator or voting. Uh, whereas government does offer informational services on a pretty routine basis back to the public. So that's the first dimension. I'm going to run this through quickly. Then there's resources. Um, and well, by resources, we're really talking money. So of course, the public on the, on the left side is paying taxes. So you have those resources going to government. But the government is turning around and through contractual arrangements, uh, transferring tremendous amounts of resources back to industry. Um, so, you know, industry, it turns out, has at least two revenue streams. Uh, the government, uh, either at the federal or at um, more local levels, is often the number one client of a given industry. That's certainly true with both uh, uh, the food and the um, um, uh, medical industries. And then, of course, that back and forth from the from public to industry is obvious with the heavier line uh, going from the public to industry. Uh, the industry does provide goods and services, but of course there is profit involved, so the heavier line goes to industry. So you have that concentration of resources, again, to industry. Uh, the third and final um, dimension that we'll speak to here is the connection of talent. And this is not to be underestimated. The best and the brightest you know, go from the public, often through elite education, into industry in a direct line. But you also have this line from public to government. These are the diamonds in the rough. And um, it's, it's often in the case of the United States uh, through the military, people don't realize that the American Department of Defense is the largest educational institution in the world. They train people in very, very technical fields that are then, after their service is over, uh, is transferred to industry, hence that heavy line from government to industry. So again, the concentration of talent into industry gives it a natural advantage vis-a-vis -vis both government and the public. You know, ironically, it is, uh, public uh, funding of government trainees back to industry, you know, allows government allows the industry to get highly trained technical talent at taxpayer expense, not not at their own, by and large. So I just wanted to kind of point that out. We're talking about very powerful forces here, and I just wanted to get that out there up front. So now we move along. Um, this graph that you're seeing is uh, from the, um, the Google uh, Ngram viewer, which was a, uh, a project that was done by Google. It, it ended around about 2011, hence you see the cutoff. Um, but these are book titles. And uh, book titles involving biotech, you can see were basically a flat line uh, up until around about 1979, 1980. 
And then you had this explosion of books and literature on, on biotech and biotechnology, which has you know, kind of subsided slightly, but is still uh, prominent. So um, I just wanted to point that out. Within that uh, rise, we had the Human Genome Project. And I, I like this logo, which is you know, right there in the front. And you can see how multidisciplinary the, um, the Human Genome Project was, including ethics, but including all these other disciplines within, within the field working together to map the human genome. So that was a major uh, project that has had a, um, an enormous impact on advancing uh, biotechnology, uh, especially concerning um, the, the human body. So I'm gonna you know, take a little side thing here about chimeras, uh, because this is the popular image. We have these monstrosities, you know, and they go back really millennia to this fanciful idea of combining different species together and uh, we see these in mythical animals everywhere. Gargoyles, uh, the Griffith is, is a standard uh, image of the chimera and is one that the public often will associate with where biotech is going. Um, we have this, this is a rather chilling image. You know, it, it, was, um, it was done, by the way, this is not a chimera. This is actually simply a, um, it looks like a human ear being grown from a mouse. It is actually scaffolding that was implanted into the mouse uh, with the um, with the with the uh, flesh with the um, with the skin growing over that scaffolding, with the aim of providing you know creating kind of an artificial ear uh, as a prosthetic. Uh, it was experimental work, but again, this is the kind of the chilling images that much of the public gets when they associate biotech uh, being applied to um, modifying uh, animals and humans in a rather dramatic way. Um, we also have interspecies, it turns out intraspecies uh, chimeras. Uh, this is a little freaky, but uh, I'll just kind of point it out. Again, moving along quickly. Turns out that uh, very often with fraternal twins, um, one of them may die in the womb, again, early in development, and the DNA of that dead fetus is then absorbed into the surviving fetus. Uh, so you actually have not simply the DNA of the parents, but you have the DNA of that fraternal twin showing up in, um, in that surviving twin. So this is considered a chimera, you know, technically within of uh, the biological field. A little bit creepy, um, but I just wanted to point that out. Also, recipients of bone marrow transplants end up with the DNA of that donor. Uh, you don't get in blood transfusions. Blood itself is pretty ephemeral. It doesn't last in the body very long before it is, it is recycled. Bone marrow produces red blood cells in, you know, naturally and that bone marrow DNA from a donor ends up incorporated into the DNA of the recipient. Finally, and this is a kind of interesting, um, fetal DNA is incorporated into the mother. In other words, it's not simply the DNA contributed by the mother, but the father's DNA ends up incorporated into the mother and it persists. There have been studies done where they've taken 90-year-old uh, women you know, uh, who have passed on, uh, examined their brains and found that their partner's DNA was incorporated into their brains. So, you know, we, we have that going on. Um, so it's, uh, again, a bit of an aside, but I kind of wanted to point out, you know, how, how broad ranging uh, some of this uh, can be. Then we have the interspecies chimera. So on the uh, left-hand side, you can see uh, this is a pig valve, a heart valve from a pig. And uh, these are now, I dare say, routinely implanted in humans. It turns out to be a pretty interchangeable part. Uh, the pig heart valve and the human heart valve um, seem to, to work very well as a replacement. 
I personally have a friend who has a pig valve in his own heart. Um, so technically speaking, that makes him a chimera. And then on the right-hand side, this is where you're doing some nuclear transfer uh, between species and humanizing, um, in this case, a pig organ for use by a human. Um, so that that's going on and, and an interesting area of, of research. So we're already doing this stuff. Uh, it's just not manifesting itself, you know, in, in terms of monstrosities. It's incorporated into the familiar human corpus. Um, so <clears throat> what has happened with um, the advent of uh, the genetic revolution is that we are now kind of switching our, our metaphors where previously we saw life as a book. In, any individual species was literally bound. The pages within its makeup were fixed. Uh, there was no changing it. Uh, however, now what we get is the loose leaf binder. You can cut and paste, remove and replace, edit uh, the genetic makeup of various life forms. So this is, you know, again, truly revolutionary and, and yet very subtle. Um, it, you know, we don't have the equivalent as we did with the information revolution of say a, a Steve Jobs figure uh, coming up with an iPhone. Uh, this stuff is happening uh, in a more subtle way, but every bit is revolutionary. Uh, and again, evolution uh, altering. Um, here's the key. You, if you recall that uh, n-gram viewer uh, graph of the explosion of biotech as a topic, it actually preceded the Human Genome Project. It, it really, the advent of it was a key United States Supreme Court decision, Diamond versus Chakrabarti, which held that life, life forms, unique novel life forms can be patented. This changed everything. This is where the business of biotech took off. And you had an explosion of investment into biotechnology as applied to both uh, food production uh, and, um, and medicine. So that's the, the key driver. That was 1981. So that's when the biotech revolution can really, you know, if you wanted to look at a, a, a starting point of the revolution, it was with this Supreme Court decision. It, um, this term, algemy, is, is a, a pretty good one uh, to describe the current state of things. Uh, it's a very useful metaphor. It's coined by Jeremy Rifkin in his book, Biotech Century. Actually, he wrote an entire book called Algemy. Um, which dealt with that theme. It's inspired by the, uh, the word alchemy, which is uh, believed to be derived from the Arabic word for perfection. I think we're familiar with what alchemy is, uh, you know, running from the late Middle Ages onward. And it is this idea of, uh, in this case, the idea of synthesizing gold from base materials um, that would eventually come to yield those innumerable alloys worth more than gold um, that we, we now enjoy as, and again, as a basis for our, much of our technological revolutions you know, to this day. Uh, in this case, algae is the quest for synthesizing more perfect life. So um, that is the mission, if you will. Um, but it does have those unintended consequences. Naturally, it does. So we have this problem now, an early one, of, uh, or the issue. I'll leave it to you to see it as a problem. But the idea of, of um, biopiracy. So this is the appropriation of ancient crops developed and cultivated by indigenous peoples, mostly in the peripheral regions of uh, South America and Africa. I should add Southeast Asia as well. Um, by agribusiness and pharmaceutical corporations for project for profit. Uh, one of the consequences is that, well, first of all, the, um, the indigenous peoples are not co compensated for their millennia long efforts at creating these, these crops. 
and, and maintaining those ancient lines. Um, those ancient lines are now used to mitigate the effects of that cheaply produced and um, easily transported uh, high star sugary cured meat diets that are having such an adverse effects on many of those same peoples. So, um, you know, they developed the seeds of the, um, of, of the cures of their, um, you know, um, confrontation with modernity and, and the nutritional um, cat catastrophes that that had for them. Um, I live in Oregon, I live in Ashland, Oregon. I can't help but throw in a Shakespeare quote, uh, the largest repertory theater complex in the United States is located in Ashland, Oregon, the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So here you go. Uh, oh, wonder how beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world, thou hast such people in it. So that is our conceit, if you will. Uh, we are seeking perfection. We're seeking perfection as a, as a species. And we are looking at basically um, you know, taking our world and bending it to our will, including its, its, its biological components. Now, again, we have our problem of uh, unintended consequences. So we've had notable bioethical debacles. One of the earliest was the eugenics movement. And again, this took place um, at the turn of the 20th century and had very powerful advocates. It was a bit of a perversion of uh, Darwinism. Um, and uh, its core principle was one of the ways that we can improve the quote unquote race is to eliminate the defective. A uh, very powerful idea. You had the president, then president of Stanford University was a powerful advocate for eugenics, uh, as were on, on numerous other um, captains of industry and political figures. Um, it persisted. And of course, its climatic manifestation was uh, seen in Nazi Germany. Um, and then, you know, from that, uh, of course, fell into disrepute. Although I, I would add that it still lingers. It's just not uh, openly advocated as eugenics. Uh, but you had numerous instances of sterilization, forced sterilization of the quote unquote defective, mentally defective, uh, the psychotic uh, and the, the crippled, the, the, those with say Down syndrome, et cetera. And that stuff is still on the books in the United States, in many, in many states. Uh, you can still have forced ster sterilization. Uh, it's not um, practiced, but it's on the books to this day. Um, heroin. Heroin is a biologic medicine. It's derived from the opium poppy, as we may know. Uh, if, again, at the turn of the 20th century, if you had a copy of the New York Times, uh, you might be able to open it to a full page ad for the bare heroin pill. It was widely marketed as a pain reliever. Yeah, it does a good job at that. It also had some other consequences, as we are acutely aware of now. Um, you know, it, it was widely marketed, especially target marketed in New York, New York City. And to this day, New York City is still the epicenter of uh, the heroin problem in the United States. So it's multi-generational in, in impact. Um, we've had the Tuskegee experiments. Again, this is the United States shameful episode where experiments were done on, uh, on black uh, people who, black men who were afflicted with syphilis and they comprised a control group um, of syphilitics um, to see what the effects of syphilis was and then you know, against uh, treatments for syphilis by an experimental group. Um, so those people that were afflicted would ultimately uh, have that course of the disease, you know, run uh, to the point of their becoming blind, becoming insane, uh, and dying. Um, so, so this is a, a key bioethical debacle and, and an issue that uh, is a lesson learned. Um, the medical community is uh, pretty vigilant about running experiments of this sort anymore. 
at least uh, in the United States, Europe. Um, I'm not too sure about China right now. It's just, we just don't really know. Um, but this kind of thing is, is widely frowned upon, of course, by the bioethical community. Thalidomide. Thalidomide was a, um, a medication that was developed, again, mostly in the 1960s. It was administered um, for anxiety and stress. It was a sedative. Uh, what we didn't know about thalidomide at the time was that when administered to pregnant women, it would manifest uh, birth defects, primarily uh, the missing limbs of uh, the children uh, who were then born after being exposed to thalidomide in their bodies um, uh, while, while the mother was pregnant. So that was a major scandal. And again, one that the bioethical community has you know, taken up as they again, I call it a lesson learned and has developed procedures and uh, made uh, great strides in uh, regulating the, uh, the use of medicines without thorough testing. Um, then you had a much more recent uh, issue, and this gets into genetic modification, starling corn. This is one of the first genetically modified organisms, GMOs, that kind of escaped the lab. Uh, it ended up uh, pollinating uh, beyond the experimental field. Starling corn it was, a, was really designed as an animal feed, not for human consumption. It um, turns out that it manifests certain allergens that are adverse to many humans. So it was never um, authorized for human consumption. And yet the, the pollen of starling corn got into adjacent fields and inadvertently got into the food supply um, and showed up in, in a lot of places, most notably, again, within the United States, a major Mexican food chain known as Taco Bell. So the tacos, the corn tortillas used in uh, Taco Bell tacos were um, infected with starling corn. So that was a major uh, lawsuit, class action suit, and cost hundreds of millions of dollars in, um, in lawsuits, legal and, uh, and judgments against the uh, manufacture of starling corn. Um, and then you have Theranos. This is, this is the most contemporary one, and, and this one is just fascinating to me. Uh, there is an HBO special, for those of you who have access to that. Um, the title is called Out for Blood, um, and it's the Elizabeth Holmes Theranos story. This was a biotech corporation. Here's an image of Elizabeth Holmes, and you'll notice that she's all decked out in the uh, Steve Jobs black turtleneck. Uh, not by accident, I might add, um, a charismatic figure. And sometimes we, in, in, in my view, the foresight community um, underrate the power of charisma in bending and inflecting history. Um, she had a, a hypnotic effect on people. Her corporate board included uh, former Secretary of State George Schultz, and Henry Kissinger, and uh, had major investors uh, from uh, Berkshire Hathaway Group, um, uh, the DeVos family, former Secretary of State uh, of, of Education, uh, Betsy DeVos, uh, invested $150 million into this. Oracle founder uh, Ellison, uh, likewise, 100 to $150 million investment in this machine, which was supposed to process just a very small sample of blood. And from that small sample of blood would be able to um, analyze and determine uh, the condition of, um, of the patient. Uh, all done in a machine that was basically the size of a photocopier and was literally distributed uh, in an experimental basis to um, uh, Walgreens. It's a major drugstore chain in Arizona um, where they, they actually had this machine in their, office, in their uh, uh, stores 
for blood testing of, of patients. It turned out not to work. And Elizabeth Holmes is now on trial. The trial started last week. Um, here's, here's her, um, the, the trait that she would basically use, I think, to um, become a multi-billion dollar startup was that, um, I love this image of her because she had an unblinking gaze. And I've noticed this with cult leaders everywhere, is that they don't blink. They look at you and they, it's like they're staring into your soul. It has this hypnotic effect on people. If anybody remembers uh, Silence of the Lambs and Anthony Hopkins' performance, one of the riveting things about that performance was he never blinked. Um, just wanted to kind of point that out. Um, you know, it, it is something that seems to have an effect on people. Um, so moving on. Uh, we've made great advances. Biotech has done uh, remarkable things already. They've been largely in the area of biomedicine and I mentioned food production. Um, I should mention really quickly that the, the anti-GMO movement you know, started very strong in, in Europe and has sputtered because it turned out that the ban on GMOs was simply impossible. And uh, now not only uh, has that ban on GMO foods been abandoned largely in Europe. Um, many European ag businesses are using GMOs themselves. So some of this stuff I'm afraid is, uh, is inevitable and now it's a matter of management. Um, so in the case of gene therapy, most of the research as you can see in this pie chart is uh, in the area of um, cancer research, also infectious diseases, and then also in these you know, monogenetic diseases like Down syndrome, um, Tay-Sachs disease, um, sickle cell anemia, anemia, these are inherited conditions that if you can edit the gene, you can eliminate the condition. So a lot of research being done in that area. So uh, it's, it's important to note that there are remarkable advances being done uh, with gene editing and it's ongoing. And again, quite subtle because unless you're afflicted, you wouldn't know about this stuff. So here's why in my view, the business of, um, of biotech is going to prevail because we have precedent for this. Back in the late middle ages, again, we had scriptural proscriptions against usury, both Christian and Islamic. But these proscriptions fell before the power of the mercantilist banks. It turns out that time is money um, and charging interest on something that among theologians was seen as God-given, time is God-given. How can you charge for something that was given to you by God? Uh, well, it turns out that argument fell um, and we, we now have those consequences with us. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll move on here. We have the, uh, the British Enclosure Acts uh, run, running from 1604 to 1914, which again, uh, converted the commons into real estate. So the genetic commons is no longer the genetic commons. As I mentioned, we can patent life. We've turned the gene into real estate. Uh, so you can extract value. You can monetize the gene. And it has paved, it paved the way for the industrial revolution um, in, in sometimes good ways. Lands are regulated. Zoning is sometimes a really good thing. Sometimes it's not a good idea to have a, a pig farm next to a school. Um, and also it helped in sanitizing uh, urban areas. So I just want to kind of point that out. It's not that uh, the conversion of commons to, to, um, to real estate and the conversion of genes into property uh, is unnecessarily a, a, a totally bad thing. And again, we can debate that. After all, who can resist, right? Who can resist a more perfect child? Who can resist optimal health? Global food security, enhancement, who can resist? In other words, Evolution is not only now being determined by culture per se, it's being determined by market forces. It's, it's the business of biotech 
that is driving evolution and it is market demand that is going to drive it further. So there is unambiguous good that comes from this. The first being golden rice. This is the incorporation of vitamin A into rice and its dissemination in South and Southeast Asia where there were serious deficiencies, vitamin A deficiencies in the diets, in the traditional diets of uh, those peoples and particularly the farming peoples, the rural peoples of those areas. Golden rice has had a manifestly good impact on the health of its consumers. We have drought and pest resistant crops. You know, we are better fed and nutritionally more secure as a planet than we've ever been before. And part of that has to do with the synthesizing of new forms of crops that have these traits built into them. We have biologic medicines. These biologic medicines are relatively new, but highly effective. In many cases, they are literal cures. So plaque psoriasis, diabetes, many forms of cancer, um, so, uh, multiple sclerosis is now being largely controlled. Um, Age-related macular degeneration is now got a medication that can be used effectively to control that macular degeneration, the, the blindness that, that comes with aging. So all of these, I think, are unambiguous goods. Um, gene therapies of various sorts, again, ongoing, but highly effective. And uh, we're only just beginning to see the outcomes that are coming from this. Um, RGHGH, um, this is a synthetic derivative of human growth hormone. Uh, prior to its synthesized form, human growth hormone was very, very difficult to get. It came from the human pituitary gland and it controlled uh, the growth and stature of, uh, of people. Um, and then those with deficiencies, uh, genetic and otherwise, um, you know, were, um, were, now, were now able to treat uh, this synthesized form. Um, one beneficiary of this is no less a figure than Lionel Messi. Lionel Messi, who I count as the greatest soccer player who ever lived, um, is only five foot seven, but he could have been much, much shorter because the reason he went to Spain, went to Barcelona as a teenager, was to be treated with RHGH uh, as a therapy so that he could increase his stature. Um, you know, he could have been much shorter. So again, in my view, and, and given my reverence for Lionel Messi, I would call that an unambiguous good. Um, vaccines. You know, we, we have, of course, our current you know, um, episode of the coronavirus and the vaccine that was created uh, to immunize against it. Um, however, it was preceded by uh, a decade or so of research, genetic research into uh, the coronavirus uh, from which, of course, the novel coronavirus, the COVID-19 um, evolved, mutated. You know, people don't realize that viruses are built to mutate. They're the most mutatable um, uh, life form there is. So uh, we're not done with them. Uh, regenerative medicine. So now we are able to recreate things. I'm gonna move real quick. I'm very sorry about this. Sometimes things are beyond our control. Um, I've got a neighbor doing yard work. So, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay. And then uh, the um, rising interest in nanomedicine and, and molecular biology, again, a topic all by itself. So, finally, um, we get to amb unambiguous ambivalence. And these are the ethical issues that come with biotechnologies. And this is an age old one. You know, we've seen this with technological revolutions elsewhere. Who gets what, how much, and when? Um, you know, the privileged are going to have access well before anybody else. 
Um, so we have that Brave New World Gattaca scenario, you know, using the cinematographic uh, metaphor. Um, so shall the bio enhance, you know, shall they inherit the earth? And I should add, these issues will happen sooner than you think. But, and I love this, it, this is a quote that I got from my uh, Ruth Hubbard, uh, who is a genetic scientist. She points out that trait is not fate. I mentioned the case of Lionel Messi, but we have any number of other people who have surmounted their handicaps and gone on to have a full rich lives. That said, you know, if you can um, be spared a handicap, you, you're gonna go for it, uh, I dare say. So um, th that's where I'm gonna end things now. I wanna open this up. I'm afraid I kind of had you drink from a fire hose here, but I know time is uh, of the essence. So um, let's go ahead and uh, end with this. And this is extremely important. The core principle of Darwinism, you know, um, eugenics notwithstanding, is that life flourishes in diversity. That was the core uh, takeaway from, from Darwinism. Monocrops are the most unnatural thing you can do to the land. Um, so we have to take those lessons and run with them. Okay, so there we go. Thanks for listening. Thanks for bearing with me. I hope the external noise wasn't too annoying. Questions? Thank you so much, Timothy. That was a uh, that was amazing. You covered so many uh, so many topics, and um, and I, I maybe two comments, maybe to sparkle the conversation. But I would love to to hear uh, what uh, everyone has to say. But I like the parallels between our topic last session when we talked about. Uh, autonomous weapons and and we were wondering uh, what happens when we lose control when bad actors as we name them take control when uh, unintended consequences arise and I think that's that's similar with biotechnology uh, even if we think about uh, good intentions and ultimate good uh, what happens when we lose control so that that would be a well in line of questioning and my second point would be around, um, there's something very specific to this topic that we didn't have last time, which is around what Arari called uh, the existential threat, because here we are touching to something very specific to our human nature. Uh, it, it, it might destroy what it means to be human. And I think that's very specific to our topic today. Um, so I don't know, that's that just to comment, it doesn't require any reply, but if some people want to reply along those lines uh, or want to react to what Timothy was saying, please feel free. Uh, Ram, I think. Uh, I, I'm going to jump, jump in very quickly, simply to help uh, run that forward. Um, our futurist and foresight community is very well represented in the area of, say, technological determinism, um, AI, for instance, and uh, ethno futures and design futures. I think one of the areas, and again, this comes from years of observation of our community, is that we're rather light on the biotech side. Um, we have transhumanists, um, but that's as far as it seems to go with, with a lot of folks. And the core of transhumanism is that, you know, evolution doesn't stop. We are not necessarily the crown of creation. And that uh, maybe we should be looking forward to moving beyond our species. I'll just put that out there as an uh, editorial comment. Good point. I think Ram, you wanted to react. Uh, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. So first of all, thank you so much for this. It was really, really amazing. Really great to hear your thoughts. So I wanted to, to basically point something else and, and point. So the intersection between the, the realm of technology and biotechnology, right? So we have this issue of the steroids. So first there were steroids to build muscle. Now the steroids are being basically sent to the brain. We want to make a more powerful brain. So we have one line of people trying to change or make an augmented human by using steroids and chemical compounds. So basically coming from the bio side. And we have another side coming from technology with the implants. So you can basically augment your brain and make uh, where that's where the eugenics comes in, the superior being that will be augmented 
by chemicals or by some kind of compound and the superior being that will be augmented by some form of technology, then the rest of us who don't want either. But my point is at what point this augmented being, quote, superior being, will take over because, so where's the Cro-Magnon, right? Where's the Cro-Magnon? We did away with the Cro-Magnon because our brain was superior. So now if, and I don't think we can prevent, so people are augmenting the brain, people are either using a, an implant, we're not so far away, or using the chemical compounds with steroids to make a more intelligent human being. So we may be at the, the border of the, the homo sapiens becoming homo something else, while we are still the homo sapiens, so we, we will overlap our existences. But in historical terms, the more advanced species overtakes the less advanced, then we have this whole problem of the eugenics and the quote, better or superior being overtaking the rest of us who will be the inferior. So I think we are at the position where we may have this superior being among us uh, sooner rather than later. And I think it's something that we have to attack or confront from all angles, you know, biotech and, and the tech from, from the other side, the folks like, like I that come from tech, but it's something that we need to debate and talk about and bring to the public side. So to how do we go, where do we go from here? And how do we talk about those things? So, so thanks for starting the dialogue. Yeah, I'll, I'll just um, respond this way. And again, this comes from a, a, a person who is largely nested in the public policy sphere. My uh, expertise, uh, to the extent I have expertise, is in uh, long-term public policy impacts. And it certainly fits within that. And I can tell you, just as a general um, principle, that policies of suppression don't work. Uh, so now it's a question of how do you manage it? And how do you manage it ethically? Um, how do you manage it, um, you, know, um, you know, with with equity, equity, equitably? Um, so yeah, these are looming issues, and they're not unfamiliar to us. But it's not a question of suppression; it's a question of, in my view, management. And our institutions, as currently configured, are not really good at this. Um, our, our biological, biotech regulatory agencies tend to be pretty weak um, and they're not comprehensive. Whatever we, we come up with in terms of regulation, say in the United States or Canada or Europe um, is you know, almost irrelevant because North Korea, um, China, uh, India, wherever else, you know, Tonga, it doesn't matter, you know, may end up developing super soldiers or creating uh, these in enhanced um, clinics, you know, enhancement clinics, you know. So yeah, this stuff, you know, it's going to be a whack-a-mole situation. And we need to really think long and hard about you know, where we're going as a species. I want to mention that in the chat, I saw two, two three very interesting comments from uh, Elizabeth and Jerry. Elizabeth, do you, do you want to explain in more details? Especially, I like that you connect with our job as futurists. Thank you very much, um, Sylvia and Timothy. Um, I am an applied ethicist and futures, uh, futurist in the industry. So I think it's quite funny that you said the industry takes advantage of what the government can give us and also what the public gives us. I have to deal with understanding what potential consequences um, can arise from emerging technologies that do not yet exist. Biotech is one example. Last time you looked at autonomous drones, I deal with autonomous cars. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, um, do you have any uh, sort of like best practice advice in terms of understanding unwanted consequences early on and planning for those when you decide on what kinds of policies that you're going to make, which will regulate the industry later on? I, I, yeah, I would just say that, uh, and I'm sure you're aware of this, usually you want to be very incremental about these things. You know, I often describe myself as an orthodox incrementalist in all things save circumcision. Um, and in the case of 
uh, new tech, introducing new technologies into the market, you already have some powerful constraints, uh, not the least of which uh, are other institutional forces, primarily insurance companies and lawyers. <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, I work yeah. with lawyers, yes. <laughs> okay, so you know what I mean. I do. Um, you know, so, so that's a powerful constraint on you know, introducing something willy-nilly into the marketplace. So usually you do these things, and as you know, you roll them out um, you know, as demonstration projects or in, in test markets and, and see how things go where hopefully the impacts are minimized, or the adverse impacts are minimized. So uh, you know, one of the things I'm sure you're aware of uh, in terms of the self-driving car is that you know, the, the problem is not the self-driving, uh, the smart car, the problem is having a smart road. Um, and, and so you need a complete redo of your road infrastructure, in my view, to have uh, any chance of a smart car really going anywhere um, in, in, without some, again, unintended consequences. I'll just put that out. Thank you. Maybe one thing I see is that uh, and Jerry actually connected uh, with that topic as well, asking how the risks are measured or negotiated. Do they justify the means, even if they may be harsh or difficult trade-offs on the way to biotech and hence futures? Do you want to express uh, what you mean, Anjari? And we can talk about that topic because I think being able to measure risk or quantify risk, and that, that connects with your, with your question, Elizabeth, as well. Um, Anjari, do you want to express uh, already? Are you able to talk? Yes, thank you. Very interesting discussion and um, quite provocative. My question is uh, precisely as you've outlined it, Sylvia, just wondering how the risks are negotiated, if there are any hard stops, um, are there, uh, how are decisions made around who or where the risk is um, carried or where the burden of the risk lies? And yes, some of these more complicated questions. I know you hinted at them when you discussed some of the difficult history around biotech, but, um, but you also mentioned that some of these uh, complexities continue even today. So have, have there been any progressions in terms of trying to curb the dangers of experimentation as we seek enhanced biotech futures? Um, yeah, there, there are. Uh, mechanisms in place. Uh, again, I, I already mentioned there are me industry mechanisms to kind of lawyer proof their innovations. But you also have at the university research level when you're dealing with human su subjects, um, our academicians are probably familiar with this, there are institutional review boards um, that are comprised, you know, uh, ideally with uh, ethicists and uh, experts in the research field that's being addressed uh, to minimize any uh, physical or emotional um, impacts on um, human, um, human subjects in experimental situations. So those mechanisms are in place. I, I think they're not well standardized uh, and that may be something that needs to be addressed. I think um, these, these standards need to be looked at. Just so, so you know, and I've contributed several commentaries to the American Journal of Bioethics. I recommend uh, you, you, you give that a look. It's, it covers a lot of these issues and more by people who are you know, deeply involved in the field. So um, we can't cover everything here at once, of course, but I would suggest that as a good resource to see what those issues are and how they're being uh, discussed and, uh, and, and, and handled uh, in, internally within those fields. Thank you, Timothy. Do you mind interrupting you? Uh, do you mind, do you mind uh, stopping your share scaring if you are able to do, uh, Timothy? It should be at the top and you have a red button. Perfect. So we can speak more face to face. I think that's more communal. Um, thank you for, for your replies. And I want also to underline the questioning uh, that we have from Jane. Where do you see augmented capacity as it converges with biomedicine applications, for, for example, uh, augmented intelligence? Biomanufacturing and the new escalation, is it our new Cold War? Uh, do you want to express on this, Jane? 
Well, some of, some of that has already been answered, um, and I'm I'm sort of commenting as everyone was talking, and the idea that you know the just because we can, should we, that was sort of touched upon at one point in the conversation leads, you know, was followed by the issue of, well, but if China is doing this and Russia is doing that and, 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 you know, and, and so there's almost this new cold war of escalation of, of, you know, um, uh, stamping on the ethics of, of what we can do and, and not allowing us to really explore what we should be doing. And, and so I, it was really more my, my running commentary of the conversation. And, and then you actually addressed, um, you know, some of the issues of the augmented intelligence and that came up, you know, from the, the editor as well. But so, um, but I, th I find this whole conversation fascinating and I loved Timothy, while I have a platform, how you framed you know, the issues, and first of all, I learned a lot about some of the issues, but, but the idea that, um, you know, we have come so far in really relatively short time period is, is pretty scary in some respects. So that's all. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back over because uh, I, I really want to hear from you all. I'm really enjoying it. Thank you for sharing, Jane. And, and don't hesitate also to share your opinions, just not questions, because I think together that's really where we are building collective intelligence. And actually, I would love to hear from you, Lisa, because you are our philosopher in residence here. And I, I really like your comments uh, connecting with uh, philosophy. I, I, I let you explain because I might have better terms than I can express. Oh, thank you, Sylvia. Dr. Dolan, thank you so much for this information. It's really mind blowing in a lot of ways and um, a newer topic for me. So philosophy, uh, part of that, as you mentioned, the moral philosophies, what struck me during the conversation was how many different types of ethical philosophies emerged. I I, and I'm looking at my phone only because I took pictures of the slides, so it's just for reference. But I heard you talk about um, sanctity of life, which we could say might come from a, a, a purely religious philosophy. Um, I heard you talk about um, even sort of what, what's best for the uh, number of people, so a utilitarian approach. Um, how many people can we uh, provide benefit to and how much does that outweigh? Um, I heard um, ideas about not messing with humans because only God gets to do that. So it just made me think, how often do you all as a community talk about those philosophies explicitly and talk about how those philosophies might conflict? Wonderful how you elevate the debate. Does anyone uh, want to build on this? I can, well, sorry, to just, go ahead. I was going to say, we talk about it all the time. <laughs> yeah, it, I, it, I'll, I'll just yeah. say, and I'll keep it very brief, that, um, you know, sometimes we uh, are not really cognizant of those very subtle, um, you know, undercurrents of our um, religious backgrounds and how that can be insinuated and incorporated into a, mm. A worldview and a philosophy. Um, my, my point actually was that uh, the the arguments of theologians have never prevailed against uh, business considerations, and I don't see this changing anytime soon. Um, now I could be wrong. I, I also made a reference to charismatics and uh, you know cult leaders and their special uh, impacts that I think we underestimate sometimes. So we could have some wild card, you know, charismatic come up and uh, you know, do, do something world changing. Uh, that aside, I don't think there's gonna be a lot of um, religious um, suppression you know, uh, of what I, again, I see as an inevitable process. Um, and, and I'll just leave it to the comments of others maybe to build on that. 
Yeah. Maybe one thing we've been talking about um, good things gone wrong, uh, but not that much about bad things gone good. And I think Joyce is underlining a very good example with uh, Henrietta uh, Lacks uh, cells. Uh, so she had a cancer, we discovered her cells were actually immortal. And today we are still using these cells that constantly uh, double. And now we can run a lot of experiments uh, on this. Um, human but uh, cells not related to a human anymore because she, she actually died in uh, 1951. Uh, but we are still using our cells today and that uh, enables us to not have to do this test on real humans, which is actually, uh, as I can say, uh, a bad expense for her, a gun good for our better uh, social good. So Joyce, you wanna express on this? We can listen to you. Sure. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, I, I really, I, and I, I put something in the chat that I, I think that we do talk about these, these things all the time, but I don't think we talk about them enough uh, because I don't feel like we are maybe getting our messages out there enough. And that's an issue that the APF is addressing how do we promote futurists and idea, our ideas so that people will listen, so that we can lift up this conversation to a wider audience and really use the insights to take action. That's it, thank you. Really good and really well said. Um, any reaction on this? So I just want to make a comment as someone trained as an economist. I think what we're getting to in Tim's comment about you know the mercantilism prevailing, I think the point in, in to Lisa's observations is that uh, money is trampling everything. The economic interest is stamping over like the elephant over ethics and we're letting it happen. I mean, and I think perhaps it's our roles as futurists to, hey, um, uh, stop. And don't step over that flower. It's a tulip and we can sell it for a lot of money. I don't know what the argument is, but we have to think about some kind of argument that will resonate with people so that we can you know, shake them a little bit. If we are, we're not the winning side, right? We're not gonna have the ROI uh, to trample uh, the banker, right? The banker will win the discussion on the ROI, uh, but perhaps you have to, you know, be smarter about it and think about ways, well, perhaps, you know, well, how will we be affected if we allow biodiversity to, to go away or the ex extinction to go on? Will it be clean air? Will it be fish in the ocean? So perhaps we need to be a more clever or we need to kind of rebrand ourselves so that we can present a more coherent front against the, against the ROI or money will prevail. Just, just a thought. I'm, I'm gonna kind of come in with a couple of comments that uh, was inspired uh, by that um, uh, contributor. And that is uh, just a couple of things. One, one of these is a non sequitur. First of all, the incorporation of technology into the human body, you know, in my view, at long last, we figured out a use for the earlobe, you know, this thing we used to just dangle jewelry from, you know, but this is a nice inert, you know, piece of, um, you know, of flesh that has a, you know, easily a direct line to the brain, you know. So I'm saying, you know, look into what we're going to be putting into these earlobes that are going to augment us. Uh, just putting that out, uh, kind of facetiously, but I think along with I think a familiar concept for all of us about the acceleration of history is that we are also now confronting uh, an acceleration of evolution. And um, we are now in a, in, in a kind of a, a climatic confrontation, a dialectical confrontation between the economists and the ecologists, you know, that one is dealing with artificial transactions, transactions that are given value by our culture versus natural transactions, the transactions that have historically, prehistorically 
uh, governed our planet and governed our, our life itself. Um, we are now at the cusp of uh, getting beyond that. And now we need to negotiate between those. It's not gonna be entirely an economic res result. It's not gonna be an entirely ecological result. There's gonna be some synthesis involved. And the direction of that is indeterminable, but I think we can anticipate it. So I would, I would maybe just, for my, for my part, kind of finish with that idea. I see a really interesting comment also in the chat regarding the array of ethics works, which I think correlates uh, with the uh, utilitarianism that Lisa was mentioning just previously. Uh, can we score, can we rate, can we quantify uh, ethics or is it in itself a contradiction of what ethics is? So um, I, I would like to nominate Lisa and Elizabeth for a topic on the ROI of ethics. So please. <laughs> if you want, we have thoughts for next meetings. We can, we can have you talk about it if you're interested in definitely. I'd love that. If I could do that with Lisa, sure. <laughs> and if I can do that with Elizabeth, it's done. Okay, let's, let's have, have you go. I, I can uh, get back to you after the meeting and we can schedule that. I, I'd love to have this conversation. Definitely, that's a wonderful topic. I, I see James wants to talk. Sorry, I didn't see the raise hand. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, I, I'm interested to know where the rubber hits the road on um, the philosophical considerations of all this and actually making things happen. Because, I mean, you, you talked about... Um, with genetic modification, bioethics. Uh, I think the, the Island of Dr. Moreau was written in about 1896. Um, you've talked about, uh, just touched on, in fact, cybernetic enhancement of human beings. I've got a book on my desk that was the first book that kicked that off, which was 1965. We've just had the Olympics for people with disabilities, which showed a huge bunch of augmented human beings doing absolutely amazing things. I know lots of people with pacemakers and uh, today uh, Ray-Band have just launched their, their sort of version of Google Glass, the wearables, you know, people are wearing smartwatches, all of this stuff, the cat's, the cat's kind of out of the bag and running around pretty wild. Uh, as you said, it's a wild predator. Whatever we decide to do in, the, in what we'll call the West, there's a whole bunch of other actors out there that won't give a Tutney hate me damn because they'll do what the heck they want in the same way that Dr. Moreau does in the in, in the book and we don't have an ethic that covers what we're doing at the moment because the context has shifted so dramatically that ethics are, are rushing to, well I'm not sure they are rushing to catch up because I'm not quite sure who's doing the rushing but the the military industrial complex is is very much dominant um, and yesterday I was in another discussion where the main issue was the use of rhetoric as opposed to the use of debate and fact. Um, and I, I know, you know, you, you, it, I, I love the images you use, but I was interested that you've used some very uh, emotionally charged images. And we didn't talk about things like cystic fibrosis, which 40 years ago you died from before the age of 20. Um, and now people are living with it because they don't have to have any, there's a new drug that's literally just come on the market, which does, uh, I think, gene deletion or something like that. So it's almost like, the, you know, we're chasing the gates open, the horses have run, you know, what, what, what is the value? What value, ROI, if you like, can we bring from philosophy? And I, I see I've stirred the wasp's nest, so thank you. Well, uh, I'd just like to point out, James, that they, indeed, uh, we, we've been cyborgs for a long time. Uh, I notice you're wearing glasses. Technically, you're a cyborg. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, again, these things are normalized. I mean, we think they're novel, but, you know, some of this stuff is, is there. These medications, that, you know, one of which you spoke of, and some I, I also enumerated, um, are, are making these subtle differences. People's lives are being extended people's suffering being alleviated in very effective ways. Uh, it's just not happening, like I said, along the lines of the invention of the iPhone. You know, we don't have that gee whiz uh, innovation yet, 
but I think we're edging to it. And it's good for us to anticipate that. Is there a, one question I was going to ask is, is there, a, is there, um, uh, has there been any work done which shows the distribution of the work that's being done in this area? I, you know, a lot of it's in this bit, which is all boring, but brilliant and making lots of tiny iterative changes. And then there's the extreme stuff that, you know, happens at the other ends work. of the curve. I'm doing this work right now. Um, yeah, I want to jump in. I'm absolutely uh, delighted with the timing of the topic. Uh, Tim, thank you. My colleague Tim, or Dr. Nolan? Professor Nolan? What do you prefer? Just no Timmy, okay. I draw the line at Timmy. Uh, okay, it's Timmy. <laughs> uh, but thank you, uh, Nolan, for bringing this. Uh, I am in the middle of a study about the future of economics. And I've been through, to answer James' question, I've been through uh, the history of genetics, the, the present history or the present of genetics, everyone who's doing biohacking or who's doing pharmaceuticals in the marketing, who is doing DNA testing. So there's a lot out there. And, but I, wanted, I raised my hand to do three things. One, maybe an invitation to Sylvia and Tim and maybe Elizabeth and kind of answering to Joyce's um, and, and uh, Ron's comment. What about we write about it? What about this is the first article we write for the, the ethics and philosophy? Because it seems like we have people from different backgrounds with knowledge to do it. And it is a like a totally a meet the moment topic. So that's something that we could write together as a APS group. Is that something that would interest you? You all. I think it's a great idea because it's it's completely a multidisciplinary topic and with different perspectives from different uh, disciplines and different backgrounds and different places of the world also uh, for me totally makes sense and I'm fully in let other talk. I'm, I've and, already mentioned that I'm, I'm uh, completing a chapter on uh, the biotechnology industrial complex you know from the foresight ethical and foresight perspective. And um, that's prodded me into realizing, of course, as you can see from this presentation, how big the topic is and how multi-dimensional multi it is and how multidisciplinary it is. Um, and so I am already uh, in the preliminary stages of proposing a book to a publisher on this very topic and collaborators are more than welcome to uh, jump in. Lisa, can you hear me better now? Sorry, uh, my, yeah, I will repeat briefly. I'm two feet down into the topic. I'm doing a research about it. And uh, my invitation is that we write together something, either for a publication outside or for the APF Compass. This could be the first article of the uh, ethics and philosophy group because we have experts, we have interested parties, we have a lot of different backgrounds. So that was my invitation to you all. Then I have um, a question for Tim. And then I have four scenarios that I would like to briefly describe to you. That's what I gather so far in terms of uh, science fiction, films, literature, everything, plus what's going on, plus the fears that people presented in the research. So we have uh, a democratic future. That's the Gataki future. That's any future that has uh, genetic determinism and social classes distributed by generic prevalence and things like that. Then we have what I call the Matusalennials, the future of the prolonged lives, either by uploaded, downloaded consciousness, change of bodies, or just by living 200 years uh, because of organ changing, things like that. Then we have enhanced versus natural, or all the disputes in terms of econ economics and how you know you can create a, a very div di div divided world into who can and who cannot. And the last one is between angels and androids, or all the futures that do not 
uh, have genetics as the main drive, but deal with transhumanism and post homo sapiens and all the things tech related. So until we become androids, all to the very last part of carbon on us, that's what we deal with. So this is what I'm working on the scenario part. There's all the market part, James, that I can share with you later. But what about, Tim, I wanted to ask you, um, direct to consumer genetic testing. What's your take on that? Well, it's already happened. I've, I've done it. <laughs> I've, What's uh, your take? Does it, is well, it useful? I'm is it not? I've done the ancestral uh, DNA stuff, and, uh, you know, which, is, which is cool, you know get into your own genealogy. Um, and it's also extremely important in terms of uh, gene marking for um, uh, congenital diseases. Um, as you may know, there are certain variants of breast cancer which are genetic uh, in, in origin. And uh, if you have a high probability of carrying that gene, it can actually lead to voluntary mastectomies or the, the decision not to have a child, um, you know, outside of adoption, I suppose, because of that high probability of passing that condition on to progeny. So, you know, that stuff's already out there. Uh, I think it will expand. There's a market for it. Come on. Um, you know, so it'll almost certainly happen. Uh, one more point I'm going to make and a bit of a non sequitur. Uh, I'm living in Oregon um, for the past solid month. Uh, we've had unhealthy air, smoke, you know, being visited by uh, environmental degradation along with so many other places. And uh, it could be that this uh, biotech revolution is going to lead us uh, back to the sea. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm betting three generations from now we're back in the sea because we've turned terrestrial life into a hellscape. I'm just putting that out to be, again, provocative. Mm -hmm. Whatever is left of the sea. I mean, I'm going to ask Sylvia about all those nets and all the stuff that we throw into the ocean. That now the ocean is becoming so acidic, no life can sustain it. The corals are going away. And, oh my God, we, we're going to go go into the galaxy. <laughs> we screwed up of the earth. Then we polluted the waters. We have to go somewhere else. Yeah, we're quoting we Shakespeare again. We do have a scenario called. Uh, in between earth and heaven. And it's, it's exactly that, how maybe with the climate change, people will go up, people with money will go up. Maybe they will have more melanin because they will change their color to be black to sustain the sun. And then who will not will go underground. And then we'll have like this network of underground living people and this network of We're up the have skies. Great people living in underground cities. That was science fiction. It was a conspiracy yes. theory. Yep. And then black people living in the skies and being the new rich and the new supremacy race. Maybe, maybe we don't have a choice. Maybe DNA's purpose is to push us into space anyway. You know, if our experiment doesn't work, you know, maybe we get wiped out and there's another species that comes along. And it has a better chance of getting out there because it it, it it models everything other that uh, biology does. It spreads. So, yeah, embrace and, it. And we didn't it's have a DNA spot. sample to put on Voyager, so <laughs> we didn't yeah, send yeah. anyone out it. there. They said, no, 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 not those. Take it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I would just like to pitch in, and I would like to draw sure, the conversation again. Yes, yes. Uh, it's 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 morning for me now, and I was uh, listening to the conversation, and I was able to catch up with uh, Team's presentation. And I would just like to like bring the conversation again to the to the question about ethics and philosophy of uh, you know the subject that we're having a conversation now, and uh, uh, listening to all the scenarios and possibilities is. Uh, it reminds me of uh, the book published by P.R. Sarkar, who is a social and spiritual philosopher in India. Uh, and uh, I, I think the, his book, Liberation of the Intellect, uh, Neo-Humanism, is pretty instructive in the sense that he acknowledged that there will be a galloping jump uh, for human civilization in, for the next 500 years. You know, He said that even in the next 100 years, there will be a galloping jump. Lots of things will happen and occur, you know, development, transformation, whatever that might be, you know, uh, definitely uh, might could occur. But the question was, 
uh, us having the the capacity and capability or perhaps the ability to reflect you know on all of this uh, changes that are going on right now and four things uh, 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 there there were four things that he tried to accentuate in that book one is sentiment you know questioning human sentiment you know it's philosophy of course it's pretty kind of subjective but uh, it, it, it's 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 kind of give you some sort of a, a, a jolt you know to contemplate uh, about human sentiment you know and he was saying that uh, while we try to make sense of all of this uh, you know uh, technology uh, he was he was saying that you know humans perhaps must learn how to expand uh, its sentiment beyond human centricity which includes of course the planet and uh, you know the animals, the plants, the rocks, among other things. Second is uh, he mentioned about uh, his idea of an awakened conscience. You know, I don't know what that is, but uh, that might, that must be interesting. About what what does it mean really to have for a human being to have an awakened conscience? Yeah, bottom line is that we're human beings, you know, <laughs> we have that, we're not just rational, you know, we're also a contemplating being, right? And uh, of course, uh, uh, he emphasized this about the need for us to nurture and grow our capacity and capability to be rational, you know, beyond uh, what we are right now. You know, th uh, I think those and of course, uh, last but not the least, is uh, spirituality. I think in order, he, he was saying that in order for us to really like, uh, you know, embed and experience what an ethical human humanist is that uh, we must learn how, you know, to, to deepen our understanding of what we really are and what makes sense to us. And uh, I think in the conversation about this, things like DNA, genetics, among other things, which are really, you know, biological, is also the idea of uh, biopsychological, uh, which is, uh, of course, human beings, are trifier beings, we're not just physical or mental, but also spiritual. So, you know, these are some questions uh, and some reflections that I would like to share with, with everyone here, because, of course, you know, I've seen in in a documentary that uh, Netflix just what uh, uh, just ran for several couple of months, that even in a controlled environment, you know, in a scientific lab, when they make experiments, they don't know really what the implications are at the societal uh, level. You know, it 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 becomes really complex. Like for example, what they did with with mosquitoes, right? You know, to uh, to you know, address the problem of uh, dengue or malaria in some parts of the world. And uh, uh, they had this idea that in order to beat that is, uh, you know, they, they created some sort of an experiment in a controlled environment where in female mosquitoes, you know, uh, grows and, you know, just, just kill the, the male part, you know, and then and every, everyone dies uh, and re reproduction stops. And uh, that would, uh, they've been saying, you know, solve the, the, the problem of, <laughs> you know, malaria or dengue. But then, of course, they don't know what the implications are. So that perhaps, uh, and uh, of course, uh, at the UNFCC, uh, there was also a conversation about frontier technologies and uh, bioengineering is one. And, uh, you know, the, the conversation was, uh, you know, new types of public good will emerge. We don't know what they are, but it will certainly emerge but when that emerges like for example the implications of uh, you know these things in 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 the public realm and it gets even more complex right and uh, no one really had the idea and uh, this reminds me of what cs Ardar said that uh, perhaps now is the time for us to have a better understanding of what ignorance really is all about so many thoughts, Sherman. I, I would like to just to underline what uh, Lisa was saying, and we actually discussed it at 
uh, the end of last session about having um, a session dedicated to uh, different perspectives. So here you're talking Eastern versus Western. Last time we discussed indigen indigenous uh, perspectives. So I think definitely uh, we will soon arrive at the point where we need to um, decolonize and, and also um, have maybe this conversation about universal versus different perspectives. Um, and last time, and that, that enables me to wrap up. Just before we wrap up, I would like to make sure everybody who raised their hands got a chance to speak. And I see that Conrad, you've been raising your hand for probably 20 or 30 minutes. So I want to make sure you get a chance to talk as well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, only uh, uh, fast, not not too much for think. Um, for me, this is, it's, it's a kind of a complex and very important uh, uh, team, this about the bioengineering, because um, the problem it is it's dri driven by market forces, by the need to, to develop technology and develop changes, but going into the way to solve deficiencies that the humans are the organisms that are around us to solve them. But this is not to evolve. It is, is to make uh, more uh, capacity like um, very, make more powerful to be better soldiers. That's, that's a very ethic problem. Have more food, but we aren't uh, making more policies to the food that we have being distributed in a, in a conscious, conscious way. Uh, this is for me the, the point that the ethics about how we must driven the development of the technology to change the way that we are and the general level that's very dangerous and it has to be very well and deep thinking about it's not in the basis of money, it's not in the basis of domination, it has to be driven really to think what the humanity must go, where is the goal that must achieve by that, and the most important of all, that we don't lose all humanity. Because we will change many things like the. If you are not talking, uh, can you unmute yourself? I see background noise. I see a background. Uh, sorry. Oh, oh, sorry. That okay. we don't uh, okay. became open and more the bridge sí. between the people that have money and diferente. the people that no are poor. Es eso, eh? Because these technologies will be at their hand, <laughs> not to all the people. And they will change also okay. the society okay. in, that, in that terms. That's, uh, that's all I want, I want to say about this thing. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. I, I personally couldn't hear everything because there was uh, some uh, background noise. Sorry about that. But thank, thank you so much for sharing your perspective. And um, maybe two last things. So first of all, I would like to make sure we are on track for our next uh, sessions. So I will just briefly share my screen again. Um, about what the program would be for next time. Okay, um, are you able to see it? Okay. Um, so last time we had uh, taking humans out of the wars of the future, this time uh, bioethics and more. Uh, I noticed three uh, action items for us. So writing a publication either for Compass uh, or else uh, around uh, Bibiana. So I guess you would be leading that effort, right? Bibiana, you want to reach out to some people? You want people to reach out to you? How do you suggest we can help you with this? So is Bibiana still with us? I can't hear you, Bibiana. All right, we can we can talk. I, I will talk with Bibiana after one of us. Uh, the second thing is about our next uh, meeting. So last time we discussed AI ethics, but I see that Ruth uh, is not with us today and it was not fully uh, decided. So what about we change and try to discuss this topic of 
ROI and how can we rate the application of ethics? And uh, Elizabeth, uh, Lisa, you had very interesting perspective around this. So if you would be up uh, for maybe connecting and try to build something, both of you, or maybe including a Bibiana as well, if you're interested, um, I'd suggest you connect and then you reach out to Chris and myself with what your topic would be, and can we we can work from there, um, work with APF to do the promotion and so on. Just maybe come back to Chris and myself within a week with a more more definite topic, and then we can uh, we can go from there. And then the other thing I heard today that and we heard it also last time that we need to have this session uh, about difference of perspectives perspectives sorry universalism versus uh, eastern western indigenous perspective i think uh, we cannot push it in too much time because it kind of comes up every time and that's a definite core aspect of our um, group i think so i suggest we can do it in november and uh, we had also last time sophia basil uh, with, with uh, there today uh, we expressed being i think she's in europe so it might be late um she expressed being interested in discussing it um so we can confirm next time, but if you can already think about it, Bibiana also, if you want to be uh, involved on this, Lisa as well, we could have a meeting dedicated to this. And last thing I wanted to suggest to end the meeting because we've been uh, touching very, um, very tough topic today. Uh, we've been talking about theory a lot and we like also to include some elements of fiction. So I don't know if for for the end of the conversation, each of you or the one of you who want to participate can maybe name or one or two pieces of fiction that you think are interesting scenarios as we think about these topics. And I suggest I will start with one myself, so maybe it gives you some time to think about it. Uh, I read uh, lately Clara and the Sun by Kazuo Ishiguro, which is not namely a science fiction writer, but still includes some element of, of science fiction in his writing. And it, as we were talking today, it really reminded me of some aspect of the book as some children in the book are lifted. So that's the name he gives to the fact that they are gene edited to be a better performing kids, whereas some other kids do not get that opportunity. And this really, really uh, raises uh, the topic of social inequality between those who can afford the treatment and the lifting in that case and those who are uh, not able to go to uh, that the same schools because of that and to get the same jobs because of that and so on so that's one i strongly recommend if you're interested in the topic but i'd love to hear your maybe fiction book or movies recommendations anyone Nothing? <laughs> you can always send them to us, to the group um, afterwards. So same as last time, what we will do at the end uh, after the session, we will send you a recap email. Um, so you will have uh, the link to the recording, hopefully, and uh, otherwise also the notes I took. I took a few notes from today, so I will share them with you. Um, next meeting will be the second Thursday of next month. I really hope we can have something around how can we uh, quantify, rate, or evaluate our ethics works with a, a hopefully a philosopher and a applied ethicist um, perspectives. And last thing before we leave, I want to thank you, Timothy, for all the preparation and the energy you put into this. Thank you for sharing uh, your wisdom, your insights, uh, your perspectives, and for leading us uh, through this conversation. And thank you all for all the insights you shared with us today. I think that was a really, really nice session. And I think the best proof of this is that two hours after the beginning, you are still so many uh, here among us. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Can I just add uh, one housekeeping item? Of uh, so uh, for uh, the, the people, not not Sylvia. So when Sylvia posts on LinkedIn, if you don't mind, just go on your own and respond and share because that will bring more people into the conversation. And there's so much good here, you know, and uh, many more people can watch. So please, if you have a chance when she posts, just go in, comment, share, etc. So if we can amplify the post and the call for APF. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ram, for underlining this. And thank you for doing it because you've been an absolute amazing supporter of the group so far. You've been amazing last time in your presentation. And indeed, like when we get the conversation going online, indeed, that helps bring some other minds to the conversation. And that's, that's absolutely necessary if we want to be um, as diverse as possible. Timothy, do you want to have a last word? <laughs> Yeah, thank you, uh, Sylvia. First, thanks to uh, the group to sit, for sticking around and um, apparently finding a sufficient interest to um, to stick around. Um, I'm I'm going to cut out right away. Uh, Argentina is about to play, and Lionel Messi, my hero, is about to take the field. So I won't take too long on this. Uh, other than make two other comments. One is, okay, we can go out into space, but just remember, the first thing that goes is your bones. So the human form, the terrestrial form is out the window, um, maybe literally and figuratively. Um, I think the most survivable form of life is the virus and maybe those are going to end up being our overlords, uh, just a, a parting thought in that regard. Um, otherwise, again, thanks so much for your attention and I'm looking forward. And I'm not kidding about um, contributors to a, a larger volume on um, the bioethical uh, dimensions of um, the biotech industrial complex. I really want to kind of develop that idea. Thanks again. Thank you all. Thank you.